Morning, lads. Morning. Anybody noticed if you've seen a, a warden today? Have you seen a warden today? Traffic warden? That's all right. No, no one sniffed round your van then. Cool. I was in a tea shop in um, Greenwich and two people walk in wearing trench coats or whatever, but they both got hats on. People stopped, people looked. It just then dawned on me, wow, they're just normal people wearing normal clothes, but look at the difference. Their whole persona, the entry, the difference that has made, purely because they've got a hat. And that's when I really started to get into hats and and it's a love affair that's really never stopped. Hats are made one way, by hand, and they have to be shaped. And it doesn't matter what the shape is, what the decade is, what the fashion is, what the style is, they have still got to be shaped and, uh, and then trimmed and sewn by hand. It's the same process. First job is the cutting room. My cutter years ago, when we used to do pretty much a lot of trade work. He was used to cutting layers of material this deep uh, so that in one cut of the blade, he could actually cut maybe 120 hats in one go. Now, this is one hat for one person, so it's scissors by hand. Materials could come from China, they could be coming from India, silk, uh, flowers coming in from Germany, um, Cinema that's handwoven coming in from the Philippines, straw from China, or it could be from Italy, Ecuador in Panama, all over the world, just for this one hat. And that can take a few phone calls. Because it's natural. You go to a shade card, and I've done this, I've made this mistake. You'll pick out um, a shade off the shade card that really matches, and that's exactly what they want. Blah, blah, blah. But they never come in the same colour because every roll is a different shade, etc. because it's natural. So the only real way of doing it is to pick the material you're gonna use when they're here and get them to approve it. This one for this customer is a single color. What we've done in the past is we blend, because we do this in three, at least three layers, we can blend um, the layers in different colors. So it, takes on a different tone. So if this person wanted um, know, slightly more turquoise in it, but it was a greeny shade, we'd then get another sort of shade, a darker shade in, throw that in the middle, and that would just bring out the, the color. But we're never too precious. As long as it tones, I'm never too precious about a match because I think they're boring. Yeah. We're ditching this piece because it's hand woven and there's a flaw there. Now that could well show up in the hat. Now that's taken, that little section there's probably taken about two hours to hand weave, but it's no good us making a hat out of a piece of material that's crap because it won't be, won't be satisfactory, so we'll just ditch it now. Rather than waste our valuable labor time, um, kill it. So we'll cut the material out. Um, to the various different sizes and shapes and lengths that we're going to need. Um, none of us by now have yet seen this hat. No sketches are done, it's still all up here, but we all know what we're expecting and what we're going to need. And hopefully most of the material we're using, we're used to using, we know it. We do get materials coming in from customers that they want us to put into their hat that have never been used in hats before should never be used in hats, or we just don't know them, and we don't know how they're going to react. There's not many firms, again, like us, where, say, the management are so on hands with the staff. I mean, nowadays, I, I can't imagine it wouldn't be any other way, but years ago, um, you'd have a large firm, which is a bent bit, that one. Yeah, you'd have a large firm where they would send in crap, and, I'd phone up because I'd see it straight away and they'd say, well, you're the first person to complain. You're the only one to complain. I said, well, maybe I'm the only one who's actually discovered it. And there's one feather firm, very, very established old feather firm. And I phoned him up and said, these are navy. No, they're black. 
I said, look, mate, I know, I know you're older and wiser than me, but this is fucking navy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> End off. Oh, no, 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 it's black, black, it's black. black. I tell you. So we'll cut it and then we'll block it. It's a real temperature gauge with this. So before we block that, we'll do what Barry's doing now. We'll spray it down to get the block to the right temperature. Natural fiber, when it's hydrated and then it's dehydrated, it's dried out, it will take a shape, it will become stiff. And then with the extra little concoctions we'll throw in like PVA or varnishes or shellacs or whatever, um, the material will go stiff. And it's very similar, if you like, to the difference between trying to iron a nylon shirt and a linen shirt. A linen shirt is nice and smooth. And a nylon shirt is always gonna be a bit of a rag. We can um, pull the material over the block, which sometimes is wood, but we use mainly aluminium because the aluminium is already hot. We used to block the crown all the way down its full depth to pull the material right down to the bottom and trying to get it pleat free means that you're putting a lot of stress on the top of the crown here, i.e. you're pulling the material really quite hard, which can in turn either rip the material or, um, or it will stress the buckram that's in the middle. And if the buckram, the buckram is woven differently to the way the silk's woven. <coughs> so the silk might be smooth, <coughs> And might work, but the buckram itself will then start to contract because we've pulled it like hell and then it will shrink back. And if it shrinks back, then you'll get all bumps, it'll go out of shape. So we then have to reset it and it's a pain. This way, by putting less stress on all the, all the various different layers of material, it's more likely to just work. And now that we're doing so many single hats where the material is quite priceless because if we get it wrong, if we, if we make a mistake, if we bugger it up, we can't get that material again. So we really don't want to cock this up and uh, this is the safest way of not cocking it up. It also means that we have to handle it less. The more handling, the more chance you're either going to wreck it or stain it if it's like really pale colours. Whereas with the silk we actually want to dehydrate it quite a lot, the Panama, because it's already got um, if you like, nature's moisture within the fibre, it's grass. To keep it being flexible and supple, we don't want it too dry. Um, if we bake it too hard, it then becomes too brittle and you could put your fingernail through the straw. People think that a Panama is a, f a hat that you can roll up. That is a myth. The quality of the grass that creates a folding Panama is so fine and it's woven so tightly, it's like linen. It's just the fact it's made out of grass rather than cotton. The time it takes to select the grass and then hand weave in such a dense weaving pattern, it can take three months. The raw material that we would use then to make the hat cost us about 500 quid. So, boys and girls, when you see advertised a folding Panama for 25 quid, it ain't. You can fold it, but it won't necessarily spring back like rubber back to the shape, which is what most people say is, oh, I've got a folder. So what does, is it still in its perfect shape? Oh no, 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 I've rolled it up once and it looks rather strange. Once we've blocked it, we then take it upstairs uh, and into the machine room where they'll cut the, the brim, if it's a brim, to the right shape. And then they'll put a supporting wire around the edge. This means that instead of the brim just being a layer of material that could then just do what it wants and be floppy, this wire will keep it stiff. Then they'll bind it on the edge to hide the wire, either in material or in a, a, a grog ground that we use, it's a ribbon. The speed of light, she folded it in half, stitched it tight against the brim, so that both sides are absolutely the same, each side. That's class. So what Pat's going to do now is she's going to machine this strip which has been cut to a shape to mimic the undulations of the, and the, the, the form of the crown. She's going to machine that onto, the, side, onto the, the crown and that way you'll get the side of the crown. 
the real trick, and which is why we get a lot of customers come to us, because either their heads are quite small, small compared to the sort of stuff they can buy in the high street, or plain large. And it's often as not, it's the large head sizes where ladies have got bigger than normal head sizes. The bone structure's different, their occiput's fuller at the back or they've got a wider brow. And they're finding that hats on sale are four, five, six centimetres too small. And this is the real trick, getting that to fit over the top. Experience has told Pat how big she wants it in the first place. And it's a standard head size. If it was small, Pat would have pulled it in more. If it was big, she would have pushed it out. But she wouldn't use the tape measure. A hat will have a head ribbon inside, uh, otherwise A, it would, it would look not good. Um, and then also it, it just makes, because the material on the inside can be rough, uh, it makes it more comfortable. And it's the head ribbon, the final sort of head ribbon, that will govern the size, and that bit she will measure. Uh, so this one's going to be 57 and a half centimetres, yeah? And she'll just put it in. Now, if anybody has ever tried to just put uh, a length of ribbon and sew it into a circle, most people will discover they've either got too much at the end or not enough. The correct head size is put in and I always recommend that we put a slightly bigger head size in than the customer's size because we can cushion it. Because when you have a hat that's really just right, depending on the environment, they might take it off. And depending on their hairstyle on this and their skin, when they take it off, they might get the red, the red mark. So it's better that the hat is just snugly, sort of snugs down with a bit of cushioning that we'll put in. So I'll just check to see if it's the right head. Perfect. And then it comes over to be finished, to be trimmed. Babe, if you could put a hand in glove drape. And that's the thing that people associate hat making. It's the decoration. That's a spare fabric. That label can now come off. All right. Okay. Standard. No lining because she's got to trim it afterwards. Just, uh, yeah. okay. All right, tar. Of course, one of the idiosyncrasies of something being made totally by hand, using uh, raw materials that are very, very natural, say like, for example, feathers. When God created chickens or cockerels or peacocks, he didn't make all their feathers the same length. And so you'll find that some feathers are a different shape or a different length, but that is a natural product. The silkworms that spew out this silk that's then woven is not always going to be identical. This is not woven nylon. And uh, when we come to then make the hat, because most of our materials, if not all of our materials, are made either very artisanally or made by hand, each one's going to be slightly different because they're cousins, not twins. All ready to go? Just a second. All right. Okay. So very much. Okay. Thank you. Linda, my trimmer, becomes my fingers. So, thank you. I can stand back and have an overview as she's sewing, and I can then ask her to reposition. It's quicker this way, and it's because it's objective. If I was doing it myself all the time, you would be fussy, but you'd be very frustrated too quickly. Whereas if somebody else is doing it and you can direct them and you're working as a team on it, a, I can see at a distance whether it's working or not. And B, if I don't think it is working, I can at least ask her to take it apart and walk away and make a cup of tea for us all. That's it, just whack them in. Yeah. All right. Okay. Could you pretty up, I think, as I say, keep that stalk in. Do you want to keep that stalk? I think I will because it sort of just adds the sort of balance yeah. to that. Okay. It gives it a, a reason. Just coming down to the brim. Either cut it at that rough end or try and twizzle it, but I think I'll just lose it where the pin goes. We will not use a ruler and a measurement. We'll use our eye. Half front veil to, to nose. To make sure that the balance to the face, to the height, to the angle, to the line. Has it got the line? Does it work? And then we'll sew that together. 
It might just give it a bit of foundation at the back. Yeah. If my trimmers haven't got the sample in front of them, in other words, as usual, it's a special commission, I'll try and get these hats done within about a week, week and a half, while the customer is still fresh here. Because you can write notes down, but because the thing has never been created and you're using trimmings that you didn't have when the customer was there, when you actually put it together, because you can remember the customer's personality and their how they were, what sort of message they wanted to get across. When you're, when you're finally putting it all together, you're thinking, hmm, this is either too much or not enough. Uh, we'll use glue. Glue has been used in millinery for centuries, and we'll use it where it's going to benefit the hat. It's very difficult to sew feathers that are as narrow as your cotton. You can't sew them. You've got to glue them. You can't get a needle through them. And um, once I'm happy, then I'll phone the client up and they'll come along and try it on. I'll get them to stand in front of the mirror and try and get them into the mindset of where they're going to be. Chill them down because, again, they've, it's unlikely they've worn that many hats. Their expectation, they really don't have one. So they're still going to be nervous and I don't want them to be nervous. I want them to be calm and I just want them to imagine themselves that morning putting the hat on. So eyes shut, ready, hat on, open eyes, and then I'll watch their reaction. Because I don't want them to feel embarrassed if they don't like it. Because, oh, it's, it's lovely. And actually, they don't like it. And if they don't like it, we're back to square one. They're not going to wear it or they're going to feel self-conscious on the day. So I'll watch their face. And, um, yeah, and you'll know. And 99 times out of 100, they just glow. And that is statement. You can have the most fantastic dress. Um, without a hat, you're a, you're a good looking person in a great dress. With a hat, they're going to really forget the dress. They're going to just remember you as the statement and they will always remember the hat. And so if you're having, if you're in an environment of a special, a really special occasion, you want a bit of a guarantee. Like the customer's friend, they all went to Ascot, three of the friends came to me. I just, and it's great, and I could design them all individual hats, and I will not make a say, the similar style for the same wedding. So if, if somebody says they're, coming, they're going to a particular wedding, and I've done a theme already for another customer going to that wedding, then they will not do the same theme. Otherwise, it would look too the same. So back to the story of the three ladies. They do invite their fourth friend to come along. Yeah, come along to, to Philip. And uh, he'll make you a hat, and it won't cost you as much as in the shops, whatever. Da -da. No, 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 no. I go to that shop near Oxford Street, or in Oxford Street. And off she goes. She's very happy and doesn't come with, with her friends to see me. And on the day she went to Ascot, on Ladies' Day, she was the one, as they're all walking down, who shrieks because she is seeing the same hat walking towards her. And she was, and she was gutted. On top of that, she paid about 1,300 quid for it. And her friends didn't pay anywhere near that. But that's why it's quite good to have it specially made when you're in an environment where you think you might see it again. It's a bit of a horror. Something you can wear all the time. You can go out, it can be raining, and you're not going to get wet. You never need an umbrella. Just something simple, something quite, you know, nothing elaborate. That's the whole thing about day wear. You don't want it too elaborate. You can make it elaborate in the colouring, like this rather subtle shade or pattern. Um, but what it's doing, it's on your head and it's a framework. It's, it's bringing the attention to the face with, without. Great face. Let's see what it does to the eyes. Hats didn't go out of fashion, they just got forgotten. Um, as a result of the change in our high street, basically our high street became dominated by chain stores and all the little independent shops, most of them in most parts of the country disappeared. So if you wanted to buy something theatrical and dramatic like they used to in the 50s, all of a sudden by the 70s it's not there. 
Consequently, four generations on, or whatever, four decades on at least, um, there's a lot of people in the world who've never worn a hat. Uh, they're not in an occasion where they need to wear one, so they think now they're feeling very self-conscious. They're not used to making that individual statement. They're quite happy to sort of wear clothes, but hat, the hat will make the difference. You can wear black and a hat, and all of a sudden it's just changed. You've got a black polar neck on. There's loads of black polar necks. But immediately now we've got the hat to the face. It's that individuality. Now, when you've got a day wear hat, which is really cool, it means you can wear it, you can wear it to the pub, you can wear it to the work, you can wear it all the time. And you're not used to wearing it. You know, I, I might have bumped into you um, and uh, shown you how fantastic it looks and, and, and you've gone with it and you've, and you've bought it and now you've got it home, you're thinking, oh God, was this a mistake? And you're starting to sort of go back to your previous inferiority mode. But no, what you do is wear it. Wear it doing the housework. Wear it anytime, any excuse. Not in the bath. And um, just wear it. So, and then gradually catch yourself. And you'll get used to seeing yourself wearing a hat. So now when you're wearing your day wear hat out and about, I can guarantee for the first two weeks, you will get people looking at you. They're always going to be looking at you. But for the first two weeks, you'll, people are going to look at you and you're going to think, what's wrong with me? And you're going to start playing with your nose or something because you think you've got something stuck to it. And then you think, oh, they're looking at me because I look a knob. And then you, well, I sort of remind you that now, why did you look at people and why did you think they look really cool in hats? Because they look really cool and that's why people are looking at you. Once they are shown that they look just as good as everybody else, and they look brilliant, they look the nuts, then you watch them grow. You, you see the shoulders go back and they, they're just different. And, um, and it's a fabulous thing. It's, that's one of the main reasons I do this, that buzz, that energy, that fulfillment, that satisfaction of, of seeing something that you've created give so much to somebody else. One lady, she said, when I first arrived I was feeling a little tired and uncertain. When I left I was feeling 20 years younger. I mean rock and roll. This firm was set up in 1889 um, and I'm sure it's a great deal different to what it was when it used to employ uh, about a thousand people. I've now got a team of five. Um, the trade has shrunk, um, but that's cool. It's a mixture of industrial repetition, always having to maintain an artistic uh, awareness of the moulding of the material that you're using. The inspiration for this, I forget what the, the artist was, but they just basically stretched fabric over, over a frame and slashed it so that the, the, the pure tension of the material, once it was slashed, it rolled back on itself. But of course, we're not putting it over a frame. We don't have that facility. It's not going to go on a wall and be, just stay there. So we're, I wanted to try and create that effect of the material peeling open, um, but on a hat. A lot of the stuff we do has never been done before. Even fashion is replicated. We are doing, we are using methods that have never been used before. Um, it's traditional, but we're taking it beyond. What I'll do is I'll release two in different parts of the world. One will go definitely to Dubai. That's fine, it's unlikely that hat will then ever come over to this side of the world. Then if I sell one in England, I'll make sure I remember who has it and where they're going with it. Even though you're buying, theoretically, one of 30, not a huge addition, but one of 30, I'd never say any of those 30 will be identical. But they're all going to look good. In the meantime, if you're having one as a special commission, which is a situation I really enjoy, um, then it's unique. And I, I mean, that's rubbish, isn't it? Because yeah. you've done that before, the flame, that's the wrong side, and it's the same job anyway, so it might as well come yeah, like that. that. We don't know if it's going to work, but the dedication and the pure, I don't know, 
creativity of my team is that they'll give it a go and they're the best. So it's going to look something like that once it's on. <laughs> when you're doing one of a style or 30 of a style if it's for a shot, there's still no computer program that can be written commercially that will make that hat for you when you're only making one. It's just not going to be commercially viable. So we do the responsible thing and use our minds and creativity ourselves and use our fingers. And that process has not changed. In a lot of countries, using staples is illegal because it means that they can't break the box up and recycle it so easily. And then metal will contaminate the paper recycling. But my hats are worth more than that. And I know if it's stapled, it ain't gonna come apart. I think I was always a bit theatrical in my dress code. I, I, I bought some uh, boots from Woolworths once and sprayed them silver. And I think I was the first person to have silver uh, Chelsea boots uh, at the League of Pity Disco at the age of 12. Um, anyway, what I'm doing is I'm creating a, a cushion of tissue all the way around the hat, creating like a, a percussion barrier. So if somebody decides to use this box as a football in transit, you never know. Or if it's just tossed or dropped, this tissue will soak up the percussion so it won't actually damage the hat. Um, this one's easy because there's no feather. When you've got some really ornate trimmings, you've then got to pack the trimmings so that it doesn't matter whether the box is upside down, left or right, dropped out of the lorry, it won't get damaged because simply after all the effort we put in and the fact that this hat's unique, <laughs> if something happened to it in transit, it would be an absolute killer. So we hate that and touch wood, um, we've had, oh, one hat that came back, came back from Buckingham Palace because they did smash it. And that was a bit of an embarrassment for the, uh, for the freight firm. But other than that though, I think we've had two hats back in 20 years because of freight, but not because of my packing. The theatre that you can create from them, the laugh that you can have with them. And when you want to disappear, you just take them off and people can't see you anymore. My universe, my rules.